Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Pallavi Adi. I'm the co-founder of Asian Pathfinders, along with Shresh Deshmukh. And we are really uh, pleased to partner with ORCA, Organization for Research on China and Asia, uh, to present you today's topic, which is China's anti-corruption campaign as a political tool and its implications. So we have two amazing speakers lined up for you today, uh, Professor B.R. Deepak and Dr. Talang Cha. Uh, before we give it to our moderator, Rahul, uh, just a brief about Asian Pathfinders. And I know Ayeshika uh, from Orca will talk about our organization briefly. So we started in 2020 as a knowledge sharing platform. Uh, we aim to promote multidisciplinary dialogues and discussions and our forum is open. Uh, our aim is to have these discussions on a variety of topics. So our topics can range from defense, security, geopolitics like today, uh, to socio-political issues and uh, uh, climate change or economics. So please uh, do uh, check our social media pages uh, to stay updated on our upcoming events. And if you do want to uh, reach out to us, uh, you can email us and write to us. Uh, these are our email addresses or like I said, you can look up Asian Pathfinders on different social media forums. <laughs> and uh, this is our today's session. Obviously, uh, Ashika will introduce about Orca. I'll uh, pass it on to you, Ashika. Hi, thank you, Pallavi. Good morning, everybody. It's such a pleasure for us to be partnering with Asian Pathfinders. Uh, I have long followed their work and uh, it's very interesting to see the kind of insight and detailed assessments they bring to the study of international affairs. Um, about ORCA, so Organization for Research on China and Asia is a new and young uh, China-focused think tank based out of New Delhi, India. Uh, the focus of ORCA is to generate uh, analysis of ground level charter in and broader developments taking place within China. And uh, ORCA sets itself apart by attempting to fill uh, a focus on enhancing the study of domestic and internal politics in China. Uh, we are a youth led and young driven, uh, you know, a youth driven venture. And the goal is to build the next generation of India's China scholars and provide them with a platform for research, publications, and networking. Uh, we generate a host of uh, research products. You can go to our website, orcaasia.org, or follow us on Twitter at the rate orca underscore India. We have a daily newsletter that seeks to um, assess ground level charter in China, call conversations in Chinese media. We publish uh, expert speak columns. We publish issue briefs, insights, as well as opinion pieces. For today's talk, it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, ORCA's own research associate, Rahul Karan Reddy. Um, he is at present in International Relations uh, uh, IR Studies uh, Master's uh, candidate from OP Jindal Global University. Uh, he is also the author of Island on the Rocks, a monograph uh, detailing the Senkaku Diayu Island dispute between China and Japan. His research focus is on China and East Asia. And he has worked previously uh, with China, Chennai Center for China Studies and a Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies. Um, for today's discussions, the thematic ideology of the topic has stemmed from a recent opinion piece Rahul had penned for Orca, focused on anti-corruption campaigns in China. I will now uh, pass the platform on to Rahul for further introductions. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy the talk. Uh, thank you, uh, Pallavi and Rishika, for that uh, warm welcome. Uh, good, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining us today for this uh, edition of Fireside Chats, uh, organized by Asian Pathfinders in collaboration with Orca. Uh, I would like to thank Pallavi, Shreyas, and Rishika for extend, extending me an opportunity to be a part of this dialogue. It really is a privilege to uh, share this uh, stage with uh, two authoritative voices on China and explore an issue of uh, some significance. Now, the topic for today's discussion, um, as you're all aware of, is China's anti-corruption campaign um, as a political tool and its gradual institutionalization. Before I introduce the topic, I'd like to take, uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Again, two experts on internal politics in China. We have with us Professor B.R. Deepak and Dr. Tilak Jha. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, professor uh, B.R. Deepak is a professor and chair at the Center for Chinese and Southeast Asian Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. 
He was trained in Chinese history and India-China relations at the Peking University and uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Beijing, and the University of Edinburgh, UK. He has been the uh, Nehru and Asia Fellow at the uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, some of Dr. Deepak's, uh, Professor Deepak's publications include India's China Dilemma, The Lost Equilibrium and Widening Asymmetries, India and China Beyond the Binary of Friendship and Enmity, and China's Global Rebalancing and New Silk Road. Some of his translations from uh, Chinese to Hindi and English include uh, China and India Dialogues of Civilizations, Parva, Ji Xianlin, A Critical Biography, The Four Books, and Chinese Poetry, 1100 BC to 1480, a translation of 85 selected classical poems for which he was awarded the 2011 Special Book Prize of China. He writes the Eye on China column uh, for the Sunday Garden. Thank you, Professor Deepa, for joining us today. Our uh, second speaker is Dr. Tiran Jha. Dr. Jha is a former BBC journalist and a former Asian Futures Media Scholar. He is currently Assistant Professor of Journalism at Times School of Media, Bennett University, and the founder of I Can Govern, a citizen-led local governance initiative. Dr. Jha is champion SPOC TSOM at Bennett International. International Relations and Corporate Affairs Office and is also a principal investigator of a two-year project to develop a technology-driven model to digitally connect migrants and residents of underdeveloped regions of Bihar. He previously worked as a China specialist with the BBC, covering the country's annual parliament session and Sino-US Sino trade war, among other topics. Uh, Dr. Jha has also worked with the Shanghai Daily, All India Radio, India Rights, and N Dimensions. And he's freelanced with Global Times, Amar Ujala, Nav Bharat Times, Quint, and a host of other startups, NGOs, and academic institutions, including uh, Asian Heritage Foundation, Zhejiang University, Hong Kong Baptist University, Nikwan New School of Public Policy, Gandhi, Sim Gandhi Smriti, and Darshan Samiti, and Friends Club. Dr. Jha was an uh, Asian Future Leader Scholar at the Pai Xian Foundation, Hong Kong, for two years at uh, Zhejiang University. Hangzhou, where he also volunteered at uh, volunteered for uh, Woodpecker Food Safety Center, which is China's first food safety NGO. Uh, Dr. Jha has uh, nearly a dozen credible book chapters and is a regular contributor to media and policy forums. Thank you, Dr. Jha, for joining us today. Uh, before I hand over to uh, Professor Deepak, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce the topic at hand. Uh, the, the anti-corruption campaign uh, is essentially to deal with corruption in China is, is quite expansive. It's a very expansive, broad effort to sort of rule out any opposition to Xi Jinping's authority in the Communist Party. Uh, and since uh, Xi Jinping became president, the anti-corruption campaign has grown in scope and scale, uh, targeting the party, the state, and recently the private sector as well. The campaign is mainly aimed at political rivals, cliques and factions in the party that oppose or could potentially challenge Xi's political authority or even resist the centralization of power that has taken place under Xi Jinping. But the campaign also targets officials for other reasons as well, uh, like poor performance, mismanagement and inefficiency. For instance, the party chief for Hebei province where COVID-19 originated, uh, he was removed from his post for failing to properly manage the epidemic response. The same thing happened in uh, Shanghai recently as well, where municipal officials were fired for their poor handling of the outbreak. And uh, since October last year, the anti-corruption campaign has turned its attention to the private sector, mainly the financial sector. So far, more than uh, 40 officials in the financial sector have been investigated for financial crimes and violations of political discipline. The campaign isn't only about the party or corruption, it's an all of society approach that covers the private sector, the state, and even dissidents and criminals abroad. The campaign even operates abroad to bring back fugitives and dissidents through uh, Operation Fox Hunt and Operation Skynet. And these are operations that are meant to hunt down dissidents, political rivals, and criminals who have escaped the mainland and now live abroad. Uh, for example, between 2018 and 2020, according to the National Supervision Commission, uh, it claimed to have brought back more than 3,800 fugitives from abroad. And uh, this brings us to the main organizations within the party that conduct the anti-corruption campaign, the Central Committee for Discipline and Inspection and the National Supervision Commission. Uh, these organizations are pervasive. They have a unit in every party body and 
and at the municipal level and the central level. It's been well integrated into the party structure and the CCBI and NSP are one of the most powerful bodies within the party. They essentially act as a deterrent to any challenge to Xi Jinping's control over the party and they keep local officials uh, fearful of any investigation into their activities as well. All these changes over the past uh, decade have massive implications for the political culture within the CCP and the landscape of any politics in China. Um, and finally, the anti-corruption campaign takes on greater significance as the 20th Party Congress approaches October of this year. And when Xi Jinping is likely to begin a third term in office, uh, the build-up to the event is being uh, shaped by several factors, of course, uh, one of which is the anti-corruption campaign, which is threatening to reignite uh, factional infighting within the party. Uh, moreover, the, the anti-corruption drive is, uh, is a populist campaign in a way because it draws on public support for crackdowns on corrupt officials and curbs on rising inequality in the country. It um, contributes to a highly charged atmosphere in the build-up to the NPC and uh, it has a significant influence on public support she can draw from and support he enjoys from inside the party. But there's plenty to go on about the CCDI and SP and how they relate to Xi Jinping's quest for leadership unity. But I'll stop here and I'll invite uh, Professor Deepak to share his views on the topic. Uh, over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you, uh, Rahul. Uh, uh, it is uh, my pleasure to be part of uh, the Fireside Chat uh, with Asian Pathfinder and uh, Orca. Uh, to be frank, uh, I didn't hear about uh, uh, this organization thanks to uh, Dr. Panda uh, of IDSA who uh, recommended uh, me to uh, Orca. Uh, so I think uh, it's uh, great to be connected uh, to uh, Asian Pathfinders uh, uh, and uh, ORCA, which I believe uh, uh, is the need of the hour because we don't have such uh, platforms uh, uh, for building capacities and uh, disseminating knowledge about China. So congratulations uh, to Asian Pathfinders for doing this wonderful job. Uh, well, uh, you know, as far as the topic is concerned, uh, uh, Rahul has, uh, uh, enunciated it uh, in uh, his uh, 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 write-up, which I have uh, gone through, uh, and uh, which I largely support uh, because I uh, believe that it has been used as a political tool to eliminate detractors from the party. But of course, it has various uh, uh, facets, uh, uh, as Rahul has uh, pointed out. What uh, I'm going to do in uh, my uh, given time is to focus on just one issue that is the uh, factional feud within uh, the Communist Party of China. And of course, it sprawled into various uh, domains as uh, it would be you know, clearer as I go on elaborating uh, these issues. At the outset, corruption uh, is endemic and systemic in any society. Uh, however, it could be uh, at uh, a different level in a society that uh, has been seen, uh, seeing mammoth growth in the last four decades of uh, reforms and where the power is absolute and, you know, you know uh, uh, if the power is absolute and absolute power is corrupts absolutely. So nevertheless, if we see the corruption perception index of uh, last year, uh, China is uh, not doing bad, uh, in fact, better than many democracies. In a list of uh, 180 countries, it has risen to 66th position from uh, 79th in 2019. This was the time when I wrote an article, a research paper uh, on China's factional politics for a book edited by Professor Manaranjan Mohanty. And the book is titled as uh, China at a Turning Point. Uh, I believe it is, uh, you know, about uh, factional feud uh, between various factions within the Communist Party of China, uh, namely the princeling, uh, in Chinese uh, it is called Tai Zedang, uh, or those having that origin. Then we have uh, Shanghai clique or Shanghai Pang, once headed by powerful Jiang Zemin, and uh, now Feng Qinghong is uh, believed to be you know, behind uh, this clique. 
Uh, then we have Communist uh, Youth League uh, or Tuan Pai, uh, once headed by Ho Chin Tao. And for simplification, I think we can also uh, uh, use uh, the simple binary of conservative uh, Pao Shou Pai or Mao Pai, uh, especially you know, conservative, those uh, uh, are more rabid or would like to follow the Maoist ideology. And reformers, so called Kai Ka Pai or Tang Pai, where one can find a mix of all these factions I just elaborated. Interest, interestingly, uh, Chinese official media uh, in a Xinhua News Agency has admitted to the existence of uh, factions within the Communist Party of China. In a report uh, uh, in 2015, it referred to factions such as uh, Secretary's Gang, uh, Mi Shu Pang, Petroleum Gang, Shi Yu Pang, and Shanxi Gang, Shanxi Pang attributed to once powerful petroleum and uh, securities are Zhou Yinkang and uh, Ling Jihua, former director of the Central uh, Committee General Office, the Communist Party of China. Uh, uh, two days later, there was another commentary uh, in the same uh, 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 news outlet. And uh, it has stated that beneath the old tigers, there are big tigers. And behind the big tigers, there are foxes and rats. Uh, and, and I think this fox hunt, you know, uh, which Rahul has mentioned about, so it uh, has also its origins here, where gangs form, there are also gang lords, where there are cliques, there are also mountaintops, and very little is known about these mountaintops, because these are behind these clique, uh, cliques uh, and uh, uh, gangs, so those who have been sabotaging the Communist Party of China. Uh, according to the leadership. And these kinds of mountaintops, uh, the statement says, are very harmful for uh, party. So it is clear from uh, you know, to these uh, uh, reports that Shanghai faction's uh, appointees were in power struggle with uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, the new gang of four, you know, which uh, Rahul also mentioned about uh, Dou Yung Kang, Ko Xi Lai, Xi Tsai Ho, and Ling Jihua, so they allegedly planned to sabotage the leadership succession agreed upon by the senior party leaders or so-called Yuan Lao in Chinese. The man behind the scene was Pro Chiang heavyweight uh, Zhou Yung Kang. So Zhou's power stretched into various apparatus of state, including court, police, paramilitary, and intelligence. Therefore, elimination of political enemies and opponents through campaigns like Killing tigers and swatting flies, Dahu Paiing, uh, tiger and fly is a euphemism for corrupt, uh, high and low ranking officials, low ranking primarily at departmental and bureau uh, levels, you know, which is huge in number. And if you want to uh, uh, refer to the figures, so you refer to uh, Rahul's uh, article. And sweep away black and eliminate evil, Saohei uh, Tuo. Uh, are being persistently carried out, mostly against the Shanghai clique, I would say, you know, which is the most uh, uh, powerful faction at this point in time, of uh, challenging the authority of Xi Jinping, you know, by doing various things inside and outside China. So I will uh, focus on uh, uh, three uh, cases. Uh, one is that of uh, Sun Li Chen, which uh, Rahul perhaps has not uh, mentioned or not elaborated enough. And then second is uh, Ren Ji Chang and the third Jack Mai. Uh, uh, this is quite uh, iron and irony uh, because the hammer has also fallen you know, uh, on those who were associated with probing some of these cases and recent finalization of Sun Li Chen, Vice the Minister of the Ministry of Public Security and Fu Zhenghua, uh, former Minister of Justice, uh, you know, is just appointed in that direction. Both Sun and uh, Fu have been associated uh, with notorious uh, 610 office, established during Jiang Zemin's reign for uh, prosecuting Falun Gong practitioners and followers. Uh, Fu tried to bend over Xi by distancing himself from Jiang faction and helped Xi in bringing down titans like Zhou Yung Kang and Hu Jintao's aide Ling Qihua. Both were given life sentence in 2015.
2014 and uh, 2016, uh, respectively. Uh, Sun Li Jun, uh, who was instrumental in uh, preparing the ground for new security law for Hong Kong since 2017, yet failed to win the trust of Xi Jinping. He was blamed for forming cliques, Gao Tuan Tuan Huo Huo, uh, in Chinese, and early this year was uh, charged for receiving bribes, Shou Hui Zui, manipulation of stock market, Cao Zong Zheng Quan Shi Chang, and illegal possession of buttons, Fei Fa Chi Yo, Qiang Zui Zui. So these three crimes you know, were slapped on Sun Li Jun. Uh, and we know that in 2015, uh, A shares uh, traded in Shanghai and Shenzhen, so went for a free fall. Uh, the crash is associated with the so-called financial copes uh, in, initiated by uh, Shanghai clique to bring down Xi. Uh, this is also perhaps one of the reasons as to why Xi Jinping has uh, opened a new stock exchange in uh, Beijing, as you all uh, must have noticed. Uh, the arrest of Chinese-Canadian businessman uh, Hua Xiaoqian in 2017 from Hong Kong, where uh, he supposedly felt safe, uh, has been also associated to this crash and has been considered as white club, Pai uh, Tao in Chinese, uh, as they call it. Uh, to many elites uh, in China. His uh, whereabouts remains unknown and is yet to be tried. The third charge is uh, the so-called assassination plot of Xi Jinping during his Nanqing visit and uh, Tuan Tong uh, the Huo Huo, uh, or these cliques uh, who were behind uh, this attempt are thought to be Gong Tao and Deng Huilin, uh, Li Xinyun and Wang Li Ke. In fact, to those who want to know more about this, you can uh, refer to uh, this CCTV TV series, Zero Tolerance, as far as corruption is concerned. And there is another man called uh, Luo Wenqin. So, so this so-called political gang has been labeled uh, to plot the assassination, though they have not uh, uh, pronounced assassination directly, but you know the Chinese character Tumo Fukui, so it is uh, believed to be uh, exactly you know uh, what they wanted to do in Nanjing uh, to Xi Jinping. Now, uh, as Xinhua has mentioned about mountain tops, so who are these mountain tops behind these cliques? Uh, the fingers are pointed towards uh, Meng Chenzhou. Uh, a former member of the Politburo uh, uh, of the CPC and Secretary of uh, Central Political and Legal Affairs Commission. Behind Meng Chento, it is believed is the hand of uh, Jiang Zemin and Sun Qingfeng, which I just mentioned uh, uh, about. Uh, it appears that Xi Jinping is gradually cleaning the sensitive political and legal system, which is supposedly infested with the remaining toxins of the petroleum and Jiangxi gang. So you can Im imagine, so the infiltration of Zhou Yung Kang, you know, uh, across uh, the spectrum of Chinese governance, uh, it is quite uh, deep. Now, the second uh, case is that of uh, Ren Tri Chang, and uh, we, we, we know Ren Tri Chang is, uh, you know, close uh, associate of uh, Wang Qishan. And Xi Jinping's long confidant, you know, and in fact, uh, uh, he uh, is the former chairman of the CCDI and was instrumental in Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign. So Ren Di Chang is a real estate uh, tycoon uh, and a close associate of Wang Qishan. He has also been proved and jailed for his criticism of Xi Jinping. If you remember those who are following, he has mentioned, uh, you know, the emperor with no clothes, uh, for Xi Jinping. It is perhaps uh, Ren Zhi Chang issue and investigation of Wang's aide Dong Hong, uh, a senior disciplinary inspector of uh, CCDI, that are said to be responsible for wedge between Xi Jinping and Wang Qishan, to the extent that those who have followed uh, Wang Qishan's recent visit to, to South Korea, uh, apart from mentioning Xi Jinping initially you know, uh, by his name, uh, in, uh, in 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 uh, subsequent uh, talks, they so didn't mention him at all, and was replaced by Ta uh, in Chinese. It means uh, he he he, not even Xi Jinping. So you can imagine, you know, the kind of uh, wedge it is uh, between two. 
uh, though the people uh, who have been investigated have been pronounced uh, as reformers, you know, to those uh, uh, favoring Tan's policy. However, the main reason is that to avoid potential financial coup, you know, of these uh, tycoons. Uh, now, my third and the final, uh, you know, uh, uh, case is about Jack Ma and uh, Didi Tushing, and also the entertainment uh, industry, which Rahul has also mentioned in his article. Uh, the faction field uh, has gone unabated. This is uh, quite clear, and it has spilled uh, over to the, you know, uh, state as well as uh, private enterprises. Uh, Xi Jinping has clipped the wings of Shanghai clique by way of uh, striking hard on their investment uh, in entities like Jack Ma's Ant Group. Anti-monopoly crackdown uh, has forced entities like Tencent, ByteDance to pay heavy fines and change the leadership at top. Entrepreneurs like Sun Tao and uh, Tang Tri Chong have been imprisoned for building agriculture and mining empires. The feud has spilled uh, over onto the Wall Street also. Uh, you know, for example, Liu Qing, a Harvard graduate, uh, he is the CEO of uh, CD Chuxing, uh, is a daughter, uh, she is the daughter of uh, Liu Twentry, founder of Lenovo, who is considered to be close to Alibaba's Jack Ma. The sons and daughters of Prince Lings have major stakes in DD. You know, for example, Boyu Capital is run by uh, Jiang Zemin's grandson, uh, Jiang Tri Chang, Doyun Lai, former CEO of uh, CICC Alpha, his son of Premier Zhu Rongqi. Ping An Insurance is managed by relatives of former Premier Wen Chiapao. Liu Le Fei, present chairman of City Capital, is son of former Politburo Standing Committee member Liu Yishan. Some like Poyu uh, Capital has huge stakes in Alibaba's hand group. Uh, it is believed that irrespective of Xi Jinping gaining control of People's Liberation Army, it is the princeling of Jiang faction that holds sway in the big businesses across China, especially in Guangdong province, you know, uh, where the GDP is uh, almost 1.7 trillion, more than half of Indian GDP. It is perhaps owing to the fear of financial coup that Xi Jinping is tightening the noose around Shanghai clique. The reason behind the crackdown on big tech, uh, app tech, and now the internet entertainment industry range for, from curtailing the financial clout you know, of uh, Shanghai clique, uh, and of course, uh, you know, various uh, 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 other issues are also involved. Uh, for the want of time, I will not be elaborating them here. The cyberspace uh, administration of China, uh, if we see the reports, has uh, dealt a heavy blow to the celebrity fan club or the fan chuan, fan uh, The State Taxation Administration on its part fined actress uh, Tang Shuang, dollar uh, 46 million of tax evasion, and Tao Wei and uh, Gao, Xiong, uh, Gao Xiaoxiong were banned uh, and their uh, content taken off from various platforms. Uh, Tao Wei is believed to be close to big bigs like Jack Ma and Wang Li, associated to Shanghai clique. So it is also believed that Tao Wei's censorship is also linked to investigations of Zhejiang Party Secretary Zhou Jianyong for the celebrities, business tycoons, and party bosses are in uh, hand and gloves, you know, uh, and form a strong alliance. The so-called Pai Shou Tao, you know, it should also be applicable uh, to uh, these uh, celebrities as well. Now, my final uh, point is uh, drawing your attention to uh, to yesterday's, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can say. Uh, 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 briefing by Xi Jinping and or sort of like order asking the party members not to, uh, you know, have or close their assets abroad, especially in the United States and uh, 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 European countries. Uh, there are speculations uh, that there are a couple of reasons behind that. Uh, one must be, you know, uh, avoiding uh, the kind of sanctions the uh, United States imposed on Russia. Uh, uh, in the wake of uh, its invasion of Ukraine. And perhaps uh, if Xi Jinping wishes to support uh, Russia or if something is discovered, the similar sanctions may follow. And another could be uh, China's uh, 
uh, you know, military action uh, in Taiwan Strait. But I think uh, there is also an element uh, uh, that is uh, the forthcoming 20th Party Congress uh, is also one of the reasons where Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping would like to use, you know, these assets of his detractors to clamp down on them. So I think with these uh, words, uh, I thank you for your patience, and I would be happy to take any questions which are posed to me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jha. That was uh, that was a fascinating, extremely uh, detailed uh, analysis and backing the factional food within uh, that the anti-corruption campaign uh, um, is is revealing. Uh, thank you again, Professor. I'd like to um, invite Dr. Jha to share his uh, his views with us now. Dr. Jha, over to you. Thank you, Rahul. Am I audible clearly? <clears throat> yes, uh, we can hear you. So. Uh, thank you, Professor Deepak, for bringing all the aspects of and nuances of how high politics and corruption works in China. <clears throat> I would like to bring uh, everybody's attention to the uh, relationship between ideology and corruption and how it tends to work and how it tends to evolve over a period of time in different uh, political setups. Uh, I mean, they, are, they happen to be a strange bedfellows in many ways, in the sense that ideology often is a theoretical moral modality to sort of justify something or the other. A certain number of people starts believing in and it becomes something which can be widely acceptable, even a mean or tool to acquire political power. Uh, but in general, I think if you talk about how most of the electoral democracies in today's time works, I mean, if you have a smooth power transition, as in the case of uh, established democracies or established institutions with something like constitutional supremacy, then uh, they have their own checks and balances. It sort of tends to work in a, in a positive direction. By positive, I essentially mean that it tends to uh, deal with corruption in a certain way and also tends to undercut too much effect of ideology. But if the system happens to be something on the other end of it or somewhere further to it, then something like a weak institution or lack of constitutional supremacy, that sort of thing. And of course, fudgy power transition systems, then it can lead to all sorts of complexities. And China happens to be a very good example of these complexities being in full play, something which Professor Deepak has very well highlighted in his depiction and description about how different factions and factional struggles sort of tend to tend to evolve in the China's context. Now, I think uh, this is something for that matter, we are talking in a specific context for China, but at the same time, we also have to keep in mind that uh, this, is, this is true for almost all countries. And historically, since the era of Great Recession in the early 20th century, whether it led to the advent of either a strong right or left or any sort of ideological alignment or political morality for social cultural power, if not more, that leads to, that becomes a hotbed, that becomes a hotbed of corruption. By the way, I think in general, corruption seems to be originating from the economic, but uh, the way it actually works, the heart of the matter is not money. The heart of the matter is power. It could be social, it could be it could be monetary, of course, but primarily it is about political, social, and cultural rather than monetary per se. So that is where the nature of corruption is also needs to be understood very, very well. And some of it at times may seem to be like a, like a positive development, social, cultural corruption. I think corruption, if we take it like that, uh, then it can also seem to be something, something positive at times, depending upon the social cultural context. For example, in China's case, the end of class, uh, in a way, they at least tried it and, and very much they superimposed it with something of their own over a period of time. But anyway, this, this is the kind of effort that happens in any kind of political situations, political changes. So they did try to do away with class at one point of time. The, inch, the previous, uh, uh, the earlier Chinese social structure was sort of thrown for a six in a way. Uh, but over the period, you know, it, it all led to different kind of, uh, different kind of, uh, complexities which we are seeing today. So upward mobility in societies and intercultural interactions, 
at times tend to accelerate you know in certain certain uh, situations where ideological one set of ideological uh, uh, you know <clears throat> realignment can force something a social cultural process that we saw in case of china at least in the early 20th century when the communists tried to get to get onto power and of course they very much did it but uh, but it tends to settle down for a different kind of uh, a kind of normal over a period of time so these are this is also one nature of corruption and it needs to be seen also in the context of ideological hegemony which again tends to settle over a period of time with a new social cultural norm so it, it is not really something which goes in one way or the other there is a very very different direction in which corruption tends to work and uh, corruption sort of tends to evolve not just in case of china but in other societies as well uh, and that is where we also have to put in the different kind of ideological alignments and realignments which have primarily sought redistribution of wealth and resources and prosperity i think all the all the major uh major uh, ideological alignments over the past 100 150 years whether it be capitalism or communism or the notions of welfare state and over a period egalitarianism of a different kind both in democracies and other countries read china's uh, campaign to sort of redistribute wealth over the over the over the since she era in particular also in the same light so i think whatever whatever um, uh, denominations or denominators he put to it it all leads to basically some sort of uh, redistribution of wealth and resources and prosperity under the name of ideological alignments and realignments now that is where it also also tends to get in a bit uh, you know basically politicians have a very very strong sense of which which issue will last how long and that is that is where these issue tends to uh, sort of get away with in ideological debates where the actual actual goals remain to be political power the actual uh, objectives remain to be sustenance of political power to hold on to it and it is not just actually in political game it has something which has happened in the case of political religious ideologies as well i think we just go back for that matter on on a more fundamental basis that how it for that matter evolves over a period of time that is something where we need to sort of think also in terms that well uh, the the entire basis of basis of you know uh, political religious ideologies of the world since the medieval era whether it be europe or eastern uh, uh, oriental societies as well i think in during the years medieval era in uh, oriental societies were relatively different but uh, i think they have also sort of caught up those those frameworks uh, at another point of time but um, but not they haven't been able to really skip it entirely <clears throat> uh, but the political religious ideologies if we see they have been based upon some sort of uh, non physical even non material dimensions of beliefs um, but in the east even with prosperity the ideological basis happened to be some sort of morality in the socio political and cultural alignment now this may sound a bit philosophical but the fact is that uh, morality and that is an important aspect where in case of china as we talk about me and a face um, the the notion to say face and this is something which is which has become prominent in china's case today but in every society once they tend to attain a certain level of prosperity they tend to look for a different a wider basis of morality which may not be limited to political it tends to go beyond the political they tend to become social they tend to become cultural and of course they tend to become uh, economical as well over a period of time so this this is also something that uh, the 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 nuances of morality needs to be seen in case of eastern societies including china now what what kind of morality will sustain in a society is over a period i think the history teaches us that it tends to uh, the morality which basically politicians also want us to believe even those who want to hold on to power want to want us to believe ultimately tends to be guided by some sort of spiritual natural idealism but the spiritual natural basis of morality is uh, Uh, something that basically tends to shift if it is not on a solid basis and material morality tends to take over and this is again uh, the uh, the nature of the way morality works is is something when when the fundamental basis is material and man made especially in the artificial and industrial scene era and in a world which is guided by economic considerations there is no doubt that it tends to become a very very difficult task to hold on to 
to have a ba super base of uh, of material construct and and look, aspiring for uh, 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 end goal which happens to be in contradiction with the base so these are the kind of conflict which tends to tends to take place and one last thing about about this debate is that the takeover becomes totally complete and there is something which started around uh, post industrial revolution that is takeover becomes complete when military tends to come together and the military and the material when they change they become they try to sort of change the uh, you know influence the system then this then god save us god save us that side of situation happens and what we see is that since over the past 100 150 years in particular but over 250 years of uh, uh, of uh, you know post industrial revolution world that we have seen we have a military material base uh, ideological super base of morality evolving essentially that is where it boils down to so three ms military another m could be uh, material basis of the society and the effort to bring some sort of morality in now the fundamental these tend to be uh, seem to be fundamentally in conflict which they are not by the way but in, pra in the practical level this happens to be the case and at least when you have uh, uh, western domination which basically took over over the past 150 years in particular this has been the case that it sort of tends to look for a different a contradictory sort of goals in place now <clears throat> coming to uh, coming once back again to how it sort of works in case of china is that uh, what we see in today's china in particular is that they have also tried to have a material basis of morality they have also tried to gain military uh, dominance not just we should not just uh, focus upon the expanding military budget of china for external security threats they have a they have a bigger uh, almost as big even bigger security budget for internal security this is something phenomenal compared to what um, many other countries spend their resources to so uh, which essentially means that it's a society which which where a military happens to be or military forms of security and social or stabilizing society happens to be one of the key drivers of uh, of enforcing if i may use the word some sort of morality which is which comes from the top and the need to believe in it and if not the need to or possibly if if necessary make sure they believe in it and of course that that could that could be another m which could be added to it that happens to the media's case now media has always been a very very key pillar of the chinese nation state uh, especially in the in the post 20th century phenomena and they happen to be uh, they happen to be remaining so i think if we see the way the amount of stress that the chinese uh, uh, party state puts on media and the rhetoric it generates it's phenomenal and this is phenomenal compared to any other previous examples whether it even be of soviet russia or anything uh, and i think they have been very very intelligent we have to congratulate the chinese party state on that front that they have been very very intelligent at realizing and learning from the mistakes of the of the soviet failures uh, they have they have been very very nuanced in their handling of of media of course they have been incidences of of newspapers being shut down the websites being censored and of course uh, xinhua sha being the prime uh, prime supplier of political news in particular all across the country these phenomena remain but at the same time what we also see is that uh, uh, mili uh, they have they have been able to make people believe in the communist party state the chinese party state the leadership in in particular and i think that is where uh, for that matter post 2014 in particular uh, post 20 2012 and 2013 when she came to power uh, i think there has been some sort of consensus in political part in, in the communist party that well let corruption be taken over let let it be aligned in favor of a political of a powerful leader let it go in a certain direction which will stabilize the cpc's reign over over china for for many more years <clears throat> so that this was the initial initial thing of course uh, she has been very smart enough to turn the card upside down he has been able to pull his own gang and the data are very very uh, interesting in terms of the number of of she confidant which happen to be member of 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 uh, the cpc polit bureaus and the extended bodies that they happen to be i think almost 40, 50 to 60% according to some reports this is phenomenal and this is and this is the number which seems to be going up now 
with the way it has been it has been shaped is by she's relentless uh, hunt for uh, for uh, relentless struggle uh, for making a so called society which happens to be free from corruption almost 4 to 5 million people have been taken to uh, taken to task for their their corrupt dealings mostly financial of course but as we definitely know for sure that this was hardly ever all about this of course there were some sincere efforts 4 to 5 million people cannot be simply a number which uh, which was all fuzzed up there is no no doubt but what, uh, and, and i think uh, the swatting flies and tigers that the corruption campaign that we have seen at least in the high level of corruption dealings uh, that uh, anti corruption campaign there does seem to be quite a bit of a bit of politics involved in it but at the same time i think uh, otherwise there has been some sincerity so if you have to see this and uh, uh, anti corruption campaign into two lights one again is whether ideology preceded over politics during these anti corruption campaign or and how it has evolved over a period of time so what we see for that matter that initially when this anti corruption campaign started uh, um, after she came to power he had the support of all the factions de facto uh, even if not really um, so what he was able to pull off is a, a is an anti corruption campaign which was primarily primarily sincere in its in its in its effort uh, largely but over the period politics has taken over and with his uh, with his willingness to hang on to power this team uh, tends to be shifting uh, its political base from from being a campaign which will be widely taken on the face of it to something which is which is seen more for its for more for its uh, serving its political go goals and the way with contradictions evolving uh, in the chinese uh, socio political economic setup in particular with economic stress coming up we see more of it i think professor deepak has brought to light the um, the trading of air shares and not just that i think the entire entire uh, i think the campaign to bring prosperity the way they have shifted goals related to that and finally decided to sort of in a way uh, put it to a back burner and then of course in the post covid covid era they have their own issues to sort of deal with so we see more contradictions coming up and corruption becoming more of a political goal rather than something of of a real real task at hand now uh, so just to wrap it up uh, how much time do we have by the way um if, if you could wrap it up in maybe a minute or two that would be great. Sure, sure thank you so much so uh, <clears throat> there is a definitely an increasing realization at the level of the top, level of the top leadership that uh, and this is a result of that realization that socialism and communism needs to hold on power uh, through military military material domination if need be but at the uh, at, uh, at the at the uh, level of public rhetoric a different kind of morality needs to take over which need not be seen as a military material domination alone i think the chinese communist party needs it needs it more than ever before but there we see the contradiction there we see the inherent morality of the material military paradigm of morality which essentially comes in the conflict with a very natural process which will facilitate creation of a inclusive oasis of universalities which can somehow live in peace with each other rather than the other way around so the, the in a way what we see is that the material militaries aim to seek a spiritual base can only be created by diluting its dominating streak significantly rather dramatically that seems to be not coming yet and uh, nevertheless it also needs to be underlined that there cannot be uh, one path to attain uh, inclusive universal morality if you may say so either of the paths can ultimately lead there but however the any path must pass through uh, an immense amount of contradiction and that is the case with china's case the destination is never the end of morality or the material or the search for a perfectness there is none what there cannot be one for that matter i think on the practical level the destination is how beautifully the contradictions are managed and what we see in today's china is its failure to manage its evolving contradiction and that is becoming becoming um, leading to more contradiction and this is a sign not good for cpc not good for china's leadership and that is where we need to see this content and i think uh, uh, we'll come back to it on this issue more when questions fall thank you uh, thank you thank you uh, dr jha that was uh, fascinating and very thought provoking 
um, uh, especially in terms of the how you went about uh, detailing the roots of the campaign in ideology, morality, and social values. Uh, I'd, I'd like to move on to uh, taking a few questions. Um, I urge the audience to post any questions they may have for the speakers in the chat box. I'll begin with two questions of my own. Uh, uh, my first question is to uh, Professor Deepak. Um, how do you expect the anti-corruption campaign to influence the balance of power between factions from now until the NBC in October? Um, what can we expect at the Beidahe summit? And is this anti-corruption campaign likely to intensify or slow down before that summit approaches? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. You're on. Okay, so I think uh, it is going to intensify as uh, we have been witnessing, uh, you know, everyday uh, uh, affairs of uh, party, uh, and also uh, you know the kind of uh, maybe the tussle which is going on. I think uh, uh, though it is quite discreet, it has to be that between the line, and uh, there are you know various. Uh, uh, arguments going on in Chinese social media. In fact, this uh, uh, Tongsheng Xijiang uh, uh, analogy has been drawn to, you know, uh, Li Sheng Xijiang. Now that means uh, Li Keqiang at this point in time. So he has uh, been uh, taking control of uh, the economic affairs over Xi Jinping, and this has been, you know, reflected in the kind of uh, headlines. Uh, that Xi Jinping used to uh, grab in uh, all the media, especially the party-controlled media like uh, uh, Remy Repa, uh, People's Daily. So off late, if you see, uh, you know, a couple of days uh, back, uh, these uh, cover pages, so they had uh, not appeared uh, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, photographs or his, uh, uh, you can say, uh, his uh, uh, headlines. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, though, uh, it is also related to one of the, another question, which uh, says that, uh, you know, so he has uh, groomed his own faction. There is no doubt about it. Uh, you know, uh, his lieutenants in uh, Central Committee, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, they could be elevated, uh, 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 say, uh, uh, people like uh, Chen Minar, you know, Secretary of Chongqing Municipal Committee, uh, this Teng Shueling, uh, director of the central office of the CPC, Wu Chenghua, perhaps, uh, who is a uh, Tuan Pai, you know, uh, could also be uh, accommodated because his uh, age is uh, on his side. Uh, and Li Chang, uh, one who has stole line, uh, uh, stole, uh, you can say, show uh, in this Shanghai uh, anti, uh, uh, you can say, or say zero, uh, uh, COVID policy in Shanghai, where people they have suffered uh, a lot and there's certain resentment. But he has, uh, 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 he can say, uh, uh, dominated the uh, scene uh, uh, and uh, executing the policies of zero tolerance uh, as is, uh, you know, the agenda of Xi Jinping. Uh, as such, I think uh, the COVID itself, you know, it is uh, also being used as a campaign, the way uh, tigers and flies uh, have been used uh, uh, in China at this point in time. Otherwise, uh, it would not have uh, uh, gone the way it has gone, at least in Shanghai. Um, so uh, I think uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, the 20th Party Congress is concerned, so we, I think, see the the factional feud being intensified uh, uh, in China. And uh, it has been uh, seen uh, in various uh, you know, forms uh, uh, at this point in time, including the recent, uh, I, I, as, as I pointed out, uh, at the notification you know, asking uh, uh, the party members uh, to shut down or to, to declare their assets uh, you know, outside. So, uh, so, so in one way, uh, you know, uh, the ideological uh, uh, side of it, which uh, uh, Tilak has also uh, mentioned about, I think uh, this will continue to dominate. And that's what uh, Xi Jinping is uh, trying to, uh, you know, promote. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, in uh, 20th 
party congress uh, uh, there is no doubt that uh, though there uh, are a lot of you know resentments and uh, obstructions being created for xi jinping but uh, i think uh, uh, as a whole whether it is from the ideological uh, point of view or his grip of power in china is concerned so there is no doubt that you know he would secure third term uh, in uh, in, in uh, 20th Uh, party congress if something untoward you know happens and uh, that could be of you know any 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 scale or it could be anyone's guess right um i sub quick i combine my uh, second question with another question in the chat for dr jha um uh, dr jha what is your impression of the way the chinese public has responded to the anti corruption drive and what uh, particular role do you think uh, propaganda and the media have played in shaping the kind of morality that forms the justification for an anti corruption drive and uh, has it resonated with people um in the sense that it shows how difficult it is for common people to fight corrupt against corruption and get justice for example and uh, how close is that representation from actual reality or how far away is it from actual reality all right so i think uh, um professor deepak's observations right now sort of clears the light on the issue that whether there is any doubt that she is coming back to power what it also means that they have done uh, got media to do their job well uh, essentially it means is uh, in case of in case of uh, chinese media what we see is uh, there is a there is a i think we all know for that matter i, I remember remember initially when I, i i told professor deepak once several years ago i'm not sure he remember that ki uh, this is what chinese media says he said that what else they will say they have to say the same thing means my research kya karu <laughs> so so i think uh, we had a situation at the bbc for that matter that uh, there was a press conference at times we would get to cover those press conferences but more often than not when we would go to cover that press conferences we would actually wrote write those press releases before the press conference used to happen and we would just go there to confirm that they have actually said that a couple of words here and there and that's it bingo you could almost predict that this is going to be the statement so if we live in that kind of situation uh, media is a totally blanket sort of uh, situation where there's little unpredictability and i think uh, forget forget what is happening in china with so much of media diversity in many de- democracies we see what dedicated bot driven at times and forceful propaganda even if it is vitriolic can do i think we have seen it doing in democracies so if there is just one kind of rhetoric and that too is determined it also seems to be fairly uh, well balanced i think that's what uh, shinwa sha and all these people's daily people do to make it more sensible as much sensible as possible what do you expect common people to believe in i think that's 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 true i think they do definitely believe that president xi and the communist party in china and at times uh, we do uh, we do witness that the factional struggles or for that matter uh the leadership struggles may tend to sh- tend to bring attention to some or the other the number of mentions of president xi or for that matter li keqiang or other leaders tends to in terms of number they tend to shift but the more or, more or less the party is never re- rarely in question and in ke- under xi we have we have increasingly witnessed that president xi is rarely in question rather how he, has, he ever has been and this is not going to change so whether it be third term or god forbid if there is a fourth term uh <coughs> for for president xi without any uh, dramatic change uh, we do not see this going to change for and 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 not just that i think even at the international level we see the chinese media is uh, media uh, or chinese state gradually pushing <laughs> gradually pushing its rhetoric uh, they have not always been successful covid has uh, tend sort of put uh, them with a lot of um publicity kind of publicity that they didn't want negative publicity but i think they they are going to get back they know that they have done it for 70 years hello so they they know that how it works in a couple of years from now once the economy settles down once this covid rhetoric rhetoric will pass through 
they know even the global rhetoric will come back to China, global attention will come back to China. So we have to congratulate the Chinese media managers and led by President Xi as of now, are uh, doing their job very, very well. And they know that the long-term bet remains with them. So it is actually the competition which evolved from other countries rather than it going away from China. China is here in the game and it's not going away. They are going to, going to stick to the same kind of rhetoric. Whether a competing rhetoric evolves from uh, countries such as India or for that matter, if we are able to uh, have a more vibrant, more, uh, more globally accepted demo, uh, media, then that can be a different kind of challenge. Or for that matter, if there is a new technology which crosses the great firewall, we never know if that happens. Well, then anything can happen. Great answer, Dr. Uh, now, Professor Deepak, there's one last question in the chat box if you have the time to take it. The question okay, is... Please go ahead. Yeah, so the question is on the, uh, the relationship between competence and corruption. Uh, the question says competence and corruption do go hand in hand. And uh, the person who asked the question, Shubham Sarup is the person who asked the question, and he'd like to know um, how corruption is different from uh, in China than it is compared to uh, the way we are understand corruption in India. No, I think, uh, uh, you know, corruption in any society, uh, uh, I opened uh, my remarks with this is endemic and systemic to any society, right? Uh, there is uh, no doubt about it. Uh, but I think uh, the problem is when you have uh, a mammoth, economic growth, when you have absolute power, then of course, you know, it is uh, very, very uh, different when you don't have uh, checks and balances. Of course you have checks and balances, but if these are controlled by the army, the party or the party state, then, uh, you know, it is uh, uh, altogether to very, very different uh, levels. So you can uh, imagine the kind of uh, fines have been imposed on uh, these Chinese celebrities by the party state. Uh, the fines which have been imposed on, you know, the people, those who have fled the country, then, and, and you see that uh, the declared wealth of the people, those who have been uh, implicated in corruption charges, whether they are from the enterprises or from the, uh, you know, uh, leadership. It is uh, huge, it is massive. So I think, uh, this shows, uh, uh, you know, the kind of economy you have. As I mentioned, that you know, uh, Guangdong province's uh, economy alone, it is 1.7 trillion US dollars. You know, more than half of but entire India's GDP, is. and Shanghai's uh, GDP is 600 billion US dollars. You know, huge if you can imagine. So the proportion of, uh, I believe, the uh, the the corruption you know, it is going to be a uh, high comparing what is uh, in other uh, democracies. But I think uh, maybe uh, there was uh, uh, another uh, question uh, uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Cha from Boone University, which I read here. So he had mentioned about uh, uh, these uh, two pictures. Uh, 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 one is uh, of uh, uh, and another, I don't know whose picture is that, the one was made in 2013 and another is 2016. Uh, and both revolve around, uh, you know, these issues of corruption and uh, uh, also uh, the kind of suffering the Chinese people, they are uh, subjected to by the bureaucracy. That is also, you know, another form of uh, corruption. Uh, but I think uh, Madhurandar, if, uh, you, you want to, you know, find answers, elaborate answer to those questions. So you can, especially the bureaucracy part, so you can uh, refer to Nong Min Tiao Ta, though it is a uh, slightly older uh, 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 book, uh, you know, published in 2004, but it is very, very relevant, especially uh, how the corruption works at lower levels, especially the, you know, departments and bureau levels. So it is an eye opener and how, uh, uh, and then other thing is, uh, 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 the kind of, uh, you know, uh, statements uh, which are being made by the political leadership. See, Li Keqiang himself is mentioning that there are uh, almost 600 million Chinese people who live on less than 1,000 uh, yuan per month. So 
that, you can see the kind of disparity. So there are two walls, you know, different, or maybe many walls. And in fact, uh, uh, Li, who, you know, the foremost agriculturist of China, so he divides China into these, you know, four groupings. And the last two in the hierarchy, so they are really, really in bad shape. And it is corruption and bureaucratic, bureaucratic you can say, suppression. Uh, it, it is, uh, uh, it is, you can say, dehumanizing, you know, uh, in, in these, uh, a, a, these these areas. And some of the other things which have come to fore is also in the writings of, uh, for example, I have also written some of the articles uh, about lying flat, you know, uh, the thumping to it. So it also reflects the similar uh, kind of, uh, you know, nature of the society uh, which the Chinese people, they find themselves in. I think I'll stop my comments here. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Deepak. I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, I'd like to thank uh, both speakers for taking the time today to do this. And uh, I'm sorry we couldn't get to uh, all of your questions due to time constraint. Uh, please uh, keep um, uh, uh, keep uh, uh, watch out for the uh, and uh, keep a track on the Orca website uh, for any new publications. And do join in every week for um, the latest fireside chat. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. Till next time. Nice meeting you here again. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.